Fintech Chatter TV. Presented by Tier 1 People. Leaders in Fintech Executive Search. Welcome to Fintech Chatter TV. I'm your host, Dexter Cousins. And in today's show, I'm joined by Matt Williamson, Vice President of Global Financial Services at Mabiquity. Matt has over 20 years of experience in banking and financial services, with prior experience at Citibank as SVP of Technology, as an authority in financial inclusion, diversity, sustainable banking, and the bank of the future, Matt is a published author, appearing in the likes of the Times newspaper, Forbes magazine, and Global Banking and Finance Review on the impact of the metaverse on financial services. Matt is regularly invited to lecture at industry events, most recently speaking on the need for diversity at the Women in Finance Summit. Founded in 2011 with a focus on mobile technology solutions, Ubiquiti's global diverse team in excess of 55 nationalities within a team of 1,200 and power over 200 million user experiences every day. To be here. Mate, it's so good to have you on. Um, You and I have known each other for, I think, 12 months now. Um, And I think at the time when we were introduced, I didn't really know who Mabiquity were. So I'm assuming there might be quite a few of my kind of subscribers who are wondering as well. So I wondered if you could share with us a little bit about Mabiquity and a bit about yourself. No problem. And you're right. I think when we first spoke, um, you weren't uh, overly uh, enthused with the overall uh, proposition until we really got into a conversation around what Mabiquity was and what that meant. Well, I think, the, to be fair, Matt, I looked at the website, right? It was just like, <laughs> not, not, a, not a great deal of research, right? So, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. But that, that's how it often works, right? As you, you, a first impression is garnered or an experience, which kind of leads into what Mabiquity is. It's actually about right. experience. That's really where our, our, our bread and butter is. So we started off as a company developing mobile apps in about 2011 in America. And then through various acquisitions and other elements, we grew into a you know, an engineering discipline, a delivery discipline, a consultancy and strategy discipline, and a CX UX discipline, but all factored around the customer experience. So Mobility is around 1,200 people globally. Um, we are part of the Hexaware group. And Mobility is one of the brands, uh, one of three, in fact. So there is Tensai, which is Automate Everything, Amaze, which is Cloudify Everything, and then Mobility is Transform Customer Experiences. And what that means is there's too much tech, as, as I referred to earlier, and if you don't make an innovative, um, intuitive experience for a customer, do they feel they got the value from what they wanted? An example I'll give is... Is it faster for me to turn the stereo up in my car, as an example, by hand or by button, or to speak via voice activation in order to do it? Which is quicker? If I use the voice activation, it's slower, right? So therefore, there was no value in that added step. Even though it's cool tech and it's exciting and we play with these things, it didn't add any value. And that's really the ethos of where we come from. So how do you remove friction from an experience? And in this case, mobility spans across um, retail, healthcare, um, and financial services, which I look after. And financial services comprises of digital banking, financial services, obviously, insurance and fintech. Um, and again, the entire focus is on removing friction from a customer journey. And in this, for most of our clients, it's our customer's customer journey. So we do everything from building digital banks from scratch to improving customer experience to even you know, some of our customers, we actually go through the app stores and see the ratings from their customers and in a lot of cases, if you go through the Google Store or Apple Store and you see, you know, there's often not that many five star ratings and lots of negative ratings. And if we're honest, a lot of the time you're in, you're likely to leave a negative rating or a rating of some description if it's a poor experience because you're infuriated. You're less likely to leave a positive one. So obviously we filter through that with our friction reports and we build out a profile of the customer and where the problems are. And then we can replay that back to our customers in banks or insurance companies, et cetera, and say, this is where your faults are. And then actually we can work backwards. So it won't just be, let's tweak some tech elements here and here. And we call it from the eyeball back to the API. So again, 
to reiterate the point, it's always about what's the customer's end experience. Have they left your interaction with your company feeling positive or in a better light? Or was it a real chore? In which case, they're more likely to leave that negative review. Yeah. I think one of the kind of initial uh, reservations that I had when we first connected, Matt, was you know, my, my thinking, oh, do I really want to work with a consultancy? Is that really what we do? And I, I think that kind of first 90 minutes that we spent talking with each other, I was absolutely convinced that I wanted to to work with Mobiquity and help you guys launch in Australia because of, I guess, not just the quality of work that you were doing, but the, the depth of it as well. And it really struck me as, hey, the, this isn't another consultancy. This is something that's very different. What would you say differentiates Mobiquity from you know, a, another digital consultancy? Uh, the, the age old question, everyone wants to differentiate themselves, right? I mean, in some ways, there are similarities, obviously, by definition, as you just described. But a lot of what we work on is actually making sure that we're sector agnostic. So yes, we have ecosystems, we've built a big ecosystem, we have partners, but the idea is it's not exclusive partnerships whereby if I'm going to build a new bank, as an example, I have to use this core banking provider because that's my partner. You know, What's the best fit for the customer? Um, I think the second part is everyone classifies themselves as having A-level talent, but in this occasion, it would be the people you meet in the initial engagement will generally be the people who are with you throughout the program. You know, traditionally, you would turn up to an engagement. I used to work in a bank. I was at Citibank for five, six years. Um, you'd be wowed and dazzled in presentations by these amazingly intelligent people who would show you, you know, the world and vision. Then when you came to the project, they were nowhere to be seen. And if you were lucky, you had some smart grads, potentially, you know, really lucky. Um, but you were still being billed X per day. Um, where we did, where we differentiate is those the talent that you meet are the talent who will deliver the project and the program. Um, a subset of that as well is, you know, if we commit to a, to deliver a program, then if it's X amount of days and X amount of time, that's what it will be. You know, we're not there in the traditional sense to land and expand. It's actually get in, do a fantastic job, you know, wow your customer, which I know sounds very cliched in today's world, but that's the goal. Be really good at your job. And then nine out of 10 times, actually, the customer asks us to do more or says that was a great experience. What else could you do for us? Or can you give us your thoughts on X, Y, and Z that's happening in the banking world in my in my world? One of the biggest challenges that I hear from from executives in banks is and, and financial services businesses is really their, I guess, ability internally to innovate. Um, not just the ideas, but to, but to execute and, and do that at a, a kind of pace and speed with which a, a fintech startup would. How does Mobiquity help large corporations like banks and financial institutions to innovate? So we're really lucky in the fact that we've worked with a lot of large corporations and institutions. Unfortunately, I can't name them because it's sensitive. But the reality is exactly as you just described, some of these organizations have recognized that they can't do it internally. And I think that's a really important part of for any business that's going to be successful in the future. It's about understanding your culture has to change. And you have to become a digital first culture, but equally you have to recognize whether you have the, the capacity internally to manage that as well. So from an innovation perspective, we actually run several innovation labs around the world where we'll take a concept all the way through to MVP um, in short sprint cycles, whether it's six weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, um, and replay that back to the customer. And then they have a decision to make on whether, well, do we launch this? Do we go to market? But they can spin these yeah. things up very quickly. Um, but at the end of, of the exercise, there's actually something tangible. It's not just a theoretical, we had a great conversation, everyone really enjoyed you know, um, pontificating and looking at the art of the possible. But at the end, you've got nothing tangible to move yeah. forward with. That's the difference. So we've come up with several of those, um, some of which have, have actually spun out into their own companies. A great example is SurePay, um, based in the Netherlands, um, and they do IBAN check-in uh, as a fraud tool to validate the person you're sending the payment to. Is that a real person? Do their details match up to who they say they are as a business, as an address, et cetera? Um, and they actually were used during COVID by the UK government's HMRC for the bounce-back loans. So they've grown oh, cool exponentially over the last 12, 18 months, um, just based on what was originally a concept in a lab in the Netherlands to becoming its own fully-fledged 
organization that's spun out on its own. And ju- I think it was the end of 2021 has just taken external funding as well to grow itself globally. Awesome. Um, one of the, kind of, I, I don't know if it's an irony, but I, I think it's something that's worth pointing out is um, you not only work with banks, financial institutions, large corporations, but you also work with, uh, I guess, fintech startups and scale-ups as well. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, I guess, first of all, why why they're working with a, a consultancy for innovation and um, I guess the role that you play in, in helping those types of businesses? Yeah, what we've what we realize is actually there is a wider ecosystem and co-creation, co- you know, collaborative space where everyone works better. Um, if we go back, so I've been in banking, I've, I've run a startup, I've been in fintech as well. Um, and what you tended to find is there was a, a dividing line between the two. The, the incumbents would say, no, no, we know this space. You have no idea with your cool new tech, et cetera. The new, you know, the new, engine, new kids on the block would come in and say, no, you've got all this legacy tech. We're going to change the world. And actually, there's a space for both because both actually have their place and their understanding. So our role is actually to sit in the middle and understand and take the best elements from each. You know, banks have been around for a long time for a reason. Um, they understand governance. They understand security, risk modeling, et cetera. Fintechs, there's no legacy. Right, there's just pure digital adoption from day one. So they're not bound by any of the things that would traditionally be there. I mean, when I was in a bank, I remember you do a you know a release on a weekend, then Monday, cross your fingers, hopefully everything was all right. Tuesday, really cross your fingers because that was the day that something went down and you'd have to roll everything back and it'd take lots of work. A fintech, it's just run a roll of code, it didn't work, junk it, fix, onto the next. I've simplified it immensely, I realize there, but they're the differences in, in planning and execution. Um, and again, they're not bound by this, what if it goes down? What happens? Because the reality is you know, a lot of the big banks, we're talking 60, 70 years of tech that's merged into one. So actually when something goes down, you don't necessarily have the answer or you hope it comes back up. Whereas with a fintech or a new entrant challenger bank, Everything's mapped out. They understand fully how it works. It's microservice or architecture. I mean, it's running on a cloud. If you need to check something, you can spin another identical instance up, test against it, make sure everything's okay, and then release it into production straight away. It's not how it used to be where you brought an entire bank down. Major changes, bring it back up slowly. It's just a completely different game. So we find that the fintechs want to work with us because we've got banking SME knowledge. So we understand how banks work, what the challenges are, who the customers are. Um, and the banks want to work with us because they understand that we can negate the risk. We understand the fintech area. We understand the challenges and the players and also how they interlink together. Because a lot of the time, as much as a, as a tech individual wants to do, you know, the panacea is, Everything's brand new and shiny, complete blank slate. For a lot of banks, that's just too big an ask still, even today, unless Chase have spun up their own digital version. um, And then eventually I suggest they'll migrate everyone across if it works. But a lot of our um, our customers are saying, we want to do the digital thing, but it's too big a leap. So how can we have a hybridized version so we can start the journey today at least and not wait? I think that's the key is if you are still waiting to start your journey, it's never going to happen, right? And it's never going to go well. You've got to start it today, even if that isn't the panacea of Greenfield, it's starting off with the experience layer and working back. But you've got to start it today. Otherwise, we'll be having this conversation in 12 months. But So what, what are some of the things that you look for then, Matt, um, when you are partnering with, with fintechs and startups? Because that that word collaboration, it's been used an awful lot over the last five, six years. And it's probably been one of the hardest things to get right. Um, what 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 are the kind of some of the factors that you think need to be there from a fintech startup in order for them to be able to work successfully with a bank and, and with a business like Mubiquity? So you're coming down really to, to base principles, I guess, of even how you hire people. Um, and it comes down to things along the lines of. I'm going to enjoy diverse. this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it, it, it is that thing of, you know, obviously people need to be smart. They need to understand what they're looking for and, and how it's going to work. But also, you know, they need to be humble. 
They need to be clear. They need to be able to make decisions quickly. Uh, and also my favorite fintechs that I like to work with are those who actually accept we're going to make mistakes, but we're going to own them. Yeah. And I think that's the difference. Yeah. Um, because I've built businesses, I've scaled them, we're scaling again where we are. And the reality is if you come at it with a view of I have to get everything right, obviously the, the plan is to get everything right, but you can't. Yeah. It's not possible. So you need to call it out when you get it wrong have a plan, you know, we've got it wrong, this is how it's going to work, this is how we're going to fix it, and then move on to the next thing. And suddenly, once you get into that cycle, things work really quickly, rather than the traditional, you know, there's a supplier and a customer, and it's the customer didn't articulate the, the value, the uh, the requirement well enough. The vendor is, is not taking ownership and not delivering on things, you know, and then it's a communication issue. So, Hmm. anyone who we can work anyone that we we choose as our partners obviously are doing well are either growing have a unique element within the banking space or the fintech space but equally have that um, humbleness that desire to make a difference to make a change but really want to demonstrate customer value because at the end of the day our success is based on the the outcome for the customer and what I mean is generally the customer's customer. You know, if you're a bank and your customer can actually you know, log on, actually, let's start from the beginning. Let's use a retail bank. A customer can choose your brand as a bank, go on the app store, download it, onboard themselves in five minutes or less and start using that account. That's a successful metric. Yeah. Okay? Not about call tech. For them, it was, you know, face ID. Couple of details pulled off my phone, driver's license, ID, whatever it is, and they're up and running. That's a successful story, and there will be a yeah. lot of players in the in the ecosystem that have provided that. You know, then there will be a a fintech or a provider on the onboarding experience. There will be a risk check. There will be a credit check supplier. There will be a core banking element in the background. There'll be a payments module. They don't all have to be from one person, and you can choose the best fit per region per client as well. So we won't have an exclusive relationship with a core banking provider as an example or a payments provider because then we're tied into it's not an ecosystem it's a delivery mechanism so we'll work with various players that will suit various budgets size growth plans strategic advantage um, globally awesome um so i'm ubiquity headquartered in amsterdam amsterdam's probably one of the hotbeds of fintech innovation and kind of startup scene right now um, what's what's kind of Ubiquity's take on on what's happening in in the Netherlands and uh, you know what what have um, you know what have you seen that's got you excited, Matt? So yeah, we're we're really lucky in that we we have uh, our experience center and one of our headquarters is Amsterdam, so Netherlands. We then have another one in the US as well, and then you know we got talking because we moved into Australia and started an APAC office. Um, we also have opened offices in South Africa. And Portugal in the last twelve months as well. But to come back to your to your question about uh, the Netherlands, what's actually happening at the moment? There's a lot of talk around the metaverse. Obviously, that's become the big yeah. thing in the last well, six to eight weeks. Uh, in some ways, it's literally that yeah, recent. You're not, you're not another growing growing man who's going down the Web three rabbit hole. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that's a really important question to ask, right? Because it, it can become a bit emperor's new clothes. So my job yeah. actually is more to review these things and understand them and not say this is exactly how it's going to look and how it's going to work for our clients. Yeah. It's more to understand and interpret, say, this is where I think certain elements could go. Um, I saw a really interesting article the other day, which is kind of Web3 metaverse, and it was on, um, so San Lorenzo is a yacht builder. And they've actually designed, so with I think it was Oculus or, or Glasses, um, managing faults on the yachts because they're often at sea you know it's expensive etc where the engineer puts the glasses on and as they are at i'm really going to show my lack of mechanical skill now the engine let's call it that um as they're looking it's fault finding and giving them examples say this is a breakdown it's almost star trek like you know iron man this is the breakdown these are the mechanics these are the schematics look for this this and this um and that's a really clever piece of tech now see that doesn't immediately map to banking, but it's those experiences that we look at in general and then see, right, from another industry, how could that map into, into the division that I run at so financial services? Um, and I've been looking at things like 
SME lending. So we use that example I gave with the yachts where you, know, you wear glasses, etc. And let's say you're in the US and you're an agricultural farmer with a credit union. Um, you had a bumper crop this year, but you don't have enough uh, machinery to harvest it in time to maximize your return because of when the market bubble is. For an, it's an example. Well, you could use your phone or something to with geolocation, etc. with the bank to say, this is the crop, it's a bumper yield, they can do geolocation time date, um, you know, draw in on historical information for, for crop yields and actually offer you a loan with the collateral being the stock, you know, the, the corn, the, the crop that you have to borrow against the machinery in order to farm it and sell it on. You know, it's, it's those sort of things that we start to look at. Um, but coming back to the, the thing we talked about earlier with you know, turning up the volume in, in your car as an example, it can't just be, this is a cool piece of tech. We've got to find a thing for it to do. It's actually got to fix something. It's got to enhance the experience, not add an additional layer. And that's usually first adopter rule, right? And, and supply chain finance, I mean, it's such that, that example that you give, such a prevalent you know, challenge, right? It's a, I remember talking to the, the guys at Judo Bank when they were launching three, four years ago, and they used almost an identical example of a client who basically had stock that they couldn't get out of customs and they needed a loan, and the loan took like three months. And this, yeah. st- this stock's just sitting there, right? <laughs> and it's crazy. It's just crazy. Exactly. And I think that's where our lens, to use that phrase, is always to to find where is the fault, where is the friction, and then how could you leverage tech to reduce that friction and improve the experience. So you know, we're seeing more and more that, um, we can sound a bit twee, but you know, digital lifestyle is becoming a thing. But digital lifestyle doesn't yeah. have to be about Oculus. It literally is, how often do you use Amazon? Maybe not use so much, but there is something delivered to my house every day. But yeah. when the concept of Amazon first came out, everyone would say, well, why would I have something every day? You know, you'd bulk all your orders up one a week or one yeah. a month, whatever it is. But we've got into that lifestyle. So that's part of a digital lifestyle. So a lot of our customers, we're, we're helping them with how can you actually add value to your customers? So, you know, another example would be, again, it's geolocation. So it's the, it's the security and the value of sharing information ID. But your device or your bank app on your device picks up that you've been to three car dealerships in a day. So by definition, mm-hmm. you're potentially car shopping. So that app pings you a notification to say, oh, hi, Matt, you, you seem to be um, looking at cars today or in the dealerships. Um, here's pre-approved loan for X amount. All you need to do is choose the color. And then straight away, they're off to the races, right? It's that digital yeah. lifestyle enablement. Or it can be as simple as we used to talk when Apple Pay first launched you know, on the London Underground, whenever that was 2015, 2016, I think it was, um, and took over from the Oyster card. It was a great piece of innovation because you just tapped your phone and you went through. But then the subset of that is in most um, train stations or metros, there is a coffee house. So why not as you tap through yeah. and, and walk through, is, oh, you know, the Danish is on us today you buy the coffee you get a free danish so you're you're creating again this collaborative ecosystem where the value to the customer is an experience but the trade-off mm. is always going to be sharing some type of data awesome now um the the, the kind of i guess the, the other um you know narrative that really resonated with me when you and i first started talking with each other was actually the the background and history of mabiquity itself it's essentially, it's still a startup business founded in what, 2011. Um, what, what, how would you kind of describe the, the culture that you've been trying to build as, as the business has been scaling and kind of maturing um, whilst moving at still a million miles an hour? That is a great question because it's really hard. Is the first thing I'd say. We all yeah, we've all read yeah. the, we've all read the books, right? Where it's grey and they do this thing and you know no rules, rules and on Netflix and it sounds amazing, but yeah. when you're in it, it's not. It's, it's yeah. it can be amazing, <laughs> but it's also really painful at times and challenging. And it comes back to the thing we talked about earlier with fintechs about making mistakes. You know, you are going to make mistakes, but what we we engender as a culture is we we push to be extremely diverse. Um, and a big part of that, about 18 months ago, we looked to rewrite um, job recs so that they weren't you know, biased by definition, gender bias towards men, as an example, by the language mm. that was used, et cetera. Um, because if you don't have a diverse workforce, then it's quite easy to become an echo chamber. 
And that is the yeah. problem with a lot of incumbents, right? You, you, everyone has more or less the same idea, which is great to a point if you're trying to accelerate. But as you mature as an organization, you need diverse opinions. Um, so yeah. we've got around, I think at last count, it was 55 different nationalities um, working at Mobility at the moment. Um, and a subset that, that, that I just mentioned then as well is everyone who joins from day one, it's not how it used to be. You know, I know when I used to join an organization back in the day, and probably the same for you, Dexter, um, you join and then it was a six-month probation period or whatever it was, and you almost had to prove your worth in order to retain and, and pass this thing. Um, whereas at Mobility, you know, from day one, your opinion is valid. If you got through the process mm. um, and the hiring uh, rounds, then day one, you're a value. You don't have to sit quietly in the corner. In fact, we encourage you to give your opinion, even if it goes against the opinion of others, potentially even more senior within the organization, because we don't want to be that echo chamber. We hired you for a reason. So we want to understand your expertise, your insight, your value. I mean, I'll give you an example. I'd been in, I think about three months and we were trying to, um, to grow a certain element of the business in the U S and my boss, who's the president, um, messaged me, it was just over chat, like Slack, saying, Matt, why haven't you done this yet? It needs to get done. Um, just do it. Um, and I, I came back and they said, no, um, which is an unusual thing to do. You know, you're quite early into you're building your relationship with your boss. I said, no, and these are the reasons why. And he just came back and yeah. said, okay, great, thanks. You know, <laughs> it, it was that level. It, it, it wasn't a – because he's Dutch as well, so the Dutch are very direct. Um, yeah. He was just – he wasn't, you know, as an Englishman, you would, could perceive that as being quite uh, borderline aggressive, you know, um, and yeah. in, in your face, whereas in, in the Dutch culture, it's not. It's very, there's very direct communication. It's not personal. Um, yeah, and yeah. he's, oh, that makes sense. And that's very much how, how we operate. And again, being mindful of other cultures is a very important element of this and learning as well. And I think what we try and factor into the culture here at Mobility as well is we don't have all the answers. Hmm. And it's imperative, I think, that you have to be clear and honest with that. So we are learning. We are going to make mistakes. Um, yeah. But if you highlight them to us, we'll learn. And it doesn't mean that you're then putting the onus on someone else. What, what we're saying is we're open enough to say we don't necessarily understand everything. So if you can articulate it and explain it, then we'll bring that in. And then we grow and we move forward. Um, and that is part of it. But the challenge is still, you know, as you know, when you're trying to hire at scale, it's a balance between speed, efficiency, and quality mm. end to end. You know, we opened last year, I say we opened three new locations around the world. Um, we'll probably do the same again this year. Um, Australia is a great example, which you helped us with. Um, and that will be somewhere between 25 and 50 people by the end of this year, yeah. which from a standing yeah. start, June last year was one. Yeah. So we, you know, the, the growth is there because the business is there and also the desire to collaborate and be innovative is there. That's – and, the, the, uh, you know, the experience that I've had, um, hands down, I would say it's the, the best hiring experience that I've been involved in. Uh, the recruitment team, it's so slick. It's ultra, ultra personal. Um, it's fast. It's attentive. Um, it's kind of all of the things that you would expect. And one of the, one of the, I guess the the frustrations that I have in, in my role is, you know, I deal with a lot of founders who are all about customer experience. And then when it comes to hiring, the people experience for people going through that process is absolutely atrocious. You, know, like you wouldn't ever consider, you know, that being your CX, but you, you're using that as a as a you know a, a system and a process and a candidate journey if it was a customer journey you you know you would you'd be making changes everywhere so yeah i love i love that mabiquity kind of you know lives and breathes the you know their you know, what they're doing for clients they're applying to their own business in every part of that um, process as well yeah completely and a key part for us as well as i mentioned is diversity but not just from diverse cultures but age range as well um, you know, we hire we hire a lot of 
grads, um, second jobs often as well, um, as in the second job they've, they've moved to from the first. Um, and a lot of time, I think the, 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 the guys and the girls that we hire are very surprised by the fact that we'll be in a meeting and say, what's your opinion? You know, we're talking about millennial, Gen Z, etc. There's no point in the 45 year old guy talking about this is what Gen Z want and this is what millennials want. You know, I've read about it and I've, I've, I've absorbed the information from various pieces, but we've got this vast resource is probably the wrong word, but um, experience or, or group of individuals who are living that on a daily basis. Why wouldn't we ask them their opinion? Why would we create, again, you know, I'm referring to echo chamber here again because I'm so anti echo chambers, but why would we create this, this great thing and then not ask that demographic that exists within our organization and knows how we work their opinion on it? Um, so you're very strong on making sure that it's not that everyone has their, their say because then you can become stagnated by everyone's opinion, but it's bringing all these data points in and forming a collaborative opinion that you can then take to market and to our customers. Yeah. Um, that, that's a really good point. How do you, yeah, how do you, how do you manage that? Because I've seen that happen a lot. You know, I even came up with a, a kind of phrase for it, which was a, ca- a camel as a horse designed by committee where when everybody gets a voice, you kind of end up building something that nobody wants and you've got two humps on there that don't really serve a purpose. So what, what, what would you say is the secret, Matt, to being able to ensure that everybody you know, feels heard and, and feels listened to, but still having to make, hey, look, we've got to make a decision and it has to be the right one? Again, it's, it's being collaborative and bringing people in. You know, at some point, someone has to make a decision. I think that that's the fair thing. You, you have to have a certain level of framework. So as an example, um, last year we launched the ESG World Banking Benchmarking Report, which was to look at are banks being consistent in their ESG policies or are they just you know carbon offsetting over here while investing heavily? Um, and a lot of people internally didn't really think that was going to be a thing. You know, No one's talking about it. The banks don't really care. Um, and for me, I was adamant. I said, this is a gap. You know, people are investing in digital. People are starting to look at ESG. You can correlate the two together. But then part of the conversation is what does that look like? And then when we looked at the market research and then internally with the younger generations, um, their piece was around um, aligning with brands that meet their authentic values. And suddenly it was, oh, that makes sense. And then we had, you know, so we had the younger demographic saying, well, look, I would go with a bank who I felt aligned with my values, i.e. was more energy efficient, green, um, invested in diverse portfolios, et cetera. Um, so that enabled us to talk to the other people on the other side who were more senior, to use a better phrase, who said, no, this isn't a thing. And then from there, you know, we've had this debate. So you've got one side saying, yes, this is definitely something we think is valid and, and makes sense. Another group that say it isn't, well, then someone has to make the decision to say, well, we're just going to investigate it and see what happens. And that then comes back to the, the thing we discussed earlier, which is you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to get everything right. So on this occasion, it worked really well. Um, and I would like to say that we were probably at the forefront of ESG for financial services, because after that point, we got massive traction when we released the report. Um, you've seen lots of our competitors suddenly running with that. But what I would add to that is when, when we created this report, I made sure, and the, the caveat was, we'll create it not as a sales tool, but this is really important. This is where the industry is going, and I want to make sure our competitors have access to this report as well because this is too important to just hold on and use as a sales vehicle. Um, and that's triggered other things. And then internally, you know, the people who were less sure, so, oh, okay, that's great. You know, they're humble enough to admit they didn't quite understand the, where it could go or the potential. Great. And the other generation who were, and it's like, this is great. My idea was heard. So, you know, it's an example of how it, it, it all came together. But ultimately, someone has to make the decision to say, we're going to drive forward with this. It worked out on this occasion, which is great. If it hadn't, then we'd have said it didn't work. On to the next thing, on to the next initiative, because you, you cannot, you have to take responsibility for things not working out, but you can't be dragged down by them either. Otherwise, you won't make the next decision. You won't do the next initiative. You won't drive forward. And I think that's the key. You've got to keep driving forward. You know, what, what has being in fintech kind of taught you about yourself and, and leadership? Has there been any big lessons at all? Yeah, I think, again, I'm going to try and stay very clear of the cliches if I can, but no doubt they'll slip in because they're there for a reason. Um, when I started, 
uh, I was in what, what you now classify as a fintech before fintech existed, um, which wow. was insane and very challenging. And again, it's not like the books. It's not like the movies where everyone's you know, having lots of fun and high-fiving and pizza. It's hard work and driving things forward and sometimes going in a direction that you don't know the answer at the end. Um, I've also done startups, which again, I was in my 40s and was incredibly naive, even though I was in my 40s and thought, this is going to be great. We've got a great idea. It does appear to be unique. Um, everyone loved it, but people just didn't want to pay for it. And then suddenly you burn through your runway, which was personal money as well. Um, having turned down a really good job elsewhere, which my wife still reminds me of from time to time. Um, so you, you constantly learn. Um, and I think, Again, the thing. How, how, how did you about. feel? How did you feel with that? Because I've I've been through that situation before. You know where I'll explain it to people that you know the the realization that you're holding an ugly baby. Um, what what was what was the moment when it kind of hit you that you you thought, oh, you know, what have I done? Yeah, I've gone gone down this path. I've invested money. I've believed in something, and actually, I've kind of I've not done enough research to figure out whether this is going to be a, a real business or not i think in truth I, it's your ego that really gets yeah. damaged if you're objective right and you go right yeah. I've, I've, I've done my research yes no money yes no etc you know if you go logically through it you can see this is where yeah. i got it right this is where i got it wrong but your ego yeah. tells you you, you, you've, you've got this wrong, you're an idiot, how could you? The whole world's laughing at you, you should have gone and done that. You know, you really can get into yeah. this, this really deep cycle. Um, and then yeah. you pile on the family pressure of oh, I've got a wife or two daughters, yeah. what we're going to do, I've got to find it. You know, you really get into that, that, that piece. But equally, you've learned an immense amount in a very compressed mm. part of time. So for me, part of it was you know, the, oh, no, what have I done? Uh, secondly, yeah. it was... But actually, look at the people I've met. Look at the things I've done. I mean, randomly, yeah. I met my first billionaire when I was doing a fintech that was hemorrhaging money left, right, and center. So I'm sat having lunch with someone say, who wants my opinion on something. I've never met a billionaire before. And it, again, I thought I would be less intimidated than I was. Um, yeah. But that would never have happened. And a lot of the people I met and the reason I'm doing the things I'm doing now would not have occurred had I not had that experience. So... Mm. Everything's a learning lesson. Obviously, monetary, you need to be able to provide for your family, um, and that's a different pressure. So that's where I really yeah. found it challenging um, of feeling I'd failed my family. Um, I hadn't. Mm. Uh, my wife was very supportive, but you've got to go for it. You've got to try, and you have to accept it doesn't always work out. As you know, I've referenced this several times throughout our conversation about the books, the films, all these things. They glamorize something. Yeah. Or yeah. there'll be a montage, right? Uh, there'll be a montage of cool music and it shows someone working really late for six months and then yeah. they're hugely successful. Well, in real life, there isn't a montage. There is six months of working really hard, ridiculous hours, and it doesn't necessarily work. And then there's that great word that has, seems to have jumped out of the fintech world, which is pivot. Right? There's yeah. pivot, pivot, pivot. And you just have to logically look, park your ego, look at... Did, is this the right reason? Does this stack up financially, market-wise, et cetera? And then if it does, how do I last long enough to get to that point mm. and pivot? And if mm. I need to pivot in a different direction to get me back to there, fantastic. Um, or the pivot can actually be an in a better business model that you didn't realize was was going to come available to you. Yeah. So when, when you look at the kind of fintech landscape, Matt, which fintech's got you most excited now and why? That is a really good question because there's so many, and as we know, so many don't actually um, actually make it. Um, a lot of the fintechs that I'm I'm looking at now that I think are exciting are the groups that are growing rapidly and making hay, making way into the market. So if we use examples like Mambu, who I know you know, and Thought Machine, and others, you go back three or four years cloud bank, cloud computing, cloud banking, cloud native um, architecture and, and delivery models, people still weren't really interested. You know, it's, it's a great concept, but it mm -hmm. won't work. And now suddenly they've landed a couple of really interesting deals and some more investment has gone into them. And now they are in you know, hyper growth 
mode. So yeah. they're really interesting. Um, we're seeing a lot around, we've already talked about you know, Web3, Meta. That's something I'm, we're going to keep an eye on and I'm going to keep an eye on see where it develops. So something I wanted to ask ask you actually, if you if you don't mind, sorry to interrupt, but um, when you were when you were talking about TravelX and your kind of early foray, I can't help but see such similar patterns within the crypto space, right? And what's happening there, and what happened fintech before fintech became fintech. So fintech really started with the exchanges and trading platforms, and if I look at crypto nearly all of the money and the, the the business that's happening you know that's the kind of the you know what i would say is a real business where you're hiring people and you're growing etc it's all exchanges it's all trading platforms it's all trading software um what do you see as being the kind of next evolution for for that space for it to really kind of kick on and then become a movement like fintech so we're actually working with some groups at the moment in that space around the, the platforms, the trade, crypto, et cetera. And depending on where you see it, they're, you know, crypto is either the greatest thing ever. It's going to save us. Um, you know, we're going to decentralize finance. We're going to go against the, the traditional banking mechanisms and the central banks, and everyone's going to lead a great life. Um, and the other side is it will never last. It will never stick. So the, the parallels that you draw, you're right. You know, there's, there's always these two camps. I think it's more likely there'll be something in the middle. I mean, I saw that... Um, I just I'm gonna look at my notes actually because I made a note of this. Um, Australia are announced in end of the year, starting now the consultancy period to potentially creating their own retail digital bank um, and looking at creating a crypto um, structure that was licensed. Um, I think that's the likely event where there'll be a, a hybridized model. I think it's unlikely we'll go to a fully decentralized where you know, the traditional monetary patents and, and instruments will disappear. I think there'll be an in-between ground where there'll be a, I can't think of a better way to articulate it other than loosely regulated. Um, it's probably a more articulate way of saying it, but uh, you know, a, a less um, stringent regulation than there currently is. Um, and again, the next generations that come through, right? the trust is inherently already built into a device. So the iPhone, you know, Galaxy, or whatever you want to call it. Um, that's where I think you'll start to see this acceleration because the people who are saying, no, 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 it won't happen, it won't work, you know, I've been around the blog, et cetera, et cetera, aren't the target audience. So they'll start adopting and leveraging and pushing around. And I don't think it's going to be the case of new, newly minted millionaires in the cryptocurrency world. It is going to be more the microtransactions in that definition that will start making this ubiquitous and people wanting to use it and, and leverage it and it will become the norm um will it be fully decentralized personally i don't think so uh, i'm happy to be proven wrong i think there is going to be this hybridized model because it, the governments um the world banks etc they're not silly they're not stupid if this is the direction it's going to go in it's better to get involved and shape and form than entirely ignore and then be disintermediated altogether now, before I rudely interrupted you, I think you were about to say BNPL. Um, yes. And I think the question was, you know, what, which, which fintechs got you excited now and why? So I think it's the BNPL space more than anything that we're seeing is growing. It was the saviour. It's, now, a, bit, it's uh, a bit controversial. Yeah, I think the BNPL space is really interesting. Um, it's a mechanism. We saw Amazon obviously pull the, the visa announcement in the UK where they were going to mm. cut the visa credit card. Um, and I said at the time, watch this space for Amazon BNPL service by provided by whoever, ready for Black Friday 2022. Obviously, they yeah. reneged on, on the deal, but that's where it's going. So, you know, I know Amazon isn't necessarily a fintech now, big tech, but you'll see that coming through. Um, I think yeah. you're going to see more and more people pushing into the buy now, pay later space. Um, and you're going to see brands. I know. We've, I think it was um, was it Klarna who've launched a card, a physical card, buy now pay later card. Um, and I think you're going to see the brands like Visa, Mastercard suddenly changing their business model from traditional, you know, APR into a buy now pay later service as yeah. well. Uh, that's where I think it's likely to go. But again, it all comes back to experience. You know, everything we've discussed so far mm. today has been about the end customer's experience and how do you make it easier yeah. and how do you create value and buy now pay net buy now pay later does that 
within the right circumstance. Obviously, I would encourage anyone to make sure they can afford whatever commitment they sign up to and agree to. But if it is the difference mm. of I can get access to this thing, whatever that may be, um, via this mechanism, why not? I think I was I had my car service recently um, at a dealership and they offered me the equivalent of a buy now, pay later. It yeah. was really interesting. So when yeah. you're servicing your car, it's quite a big bill. Um, you don't have to pay now you know, on your credit card or debit card. Would you like to sign up to four interest-free installments over the next four yeah. months, I think it was. Um, so again, that's becoming ubiquitous as a financial instrument for the masses. Mm. Um, and I think you're probably going to see that coming into – bigger and bigger purchase options, not just yeah. you know, the client for clothes or trainers or whatever. Um, I think you're going to start to yeah. see that more into car purchases, um, you know, the big ticket items. Awesome. Well, Matt, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. If uh, there are any other fintechs out there who think they might want to work with Mabiquity, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? So the best way is via our website um, or mwilliamson at mobilityinc.com or LinkedIn. Cool. And uh, if anybody's listening to this and they're interested in a career at Mobiquity, where's the best place to go? Yeah, again, same, go to our website. Um, please feel free to reach out to me as well. We have job postings around the world. Um, we're hiring extensively at the moment. Um, yeah, and I'd love to meet you and discuss what you want to do in the future. And you can find me, Dexter Cousins, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Remember to hit like and subscribe. Fintech Chatter TV. Presented by Tier 1 People. Leaders in Fintech Executive Search.